Hello and welcome to this screencast on Introduction to RNA-Seq for Researchers. My name is Michael Cimenti and I am a bioinformatics specialist and researcher within the Iowa Institute for Human Genetics. These slides and this screencast is a recap of a talk I gave recently here at the University of Iowa with the intention of introducing researchers, graduate students, postdocs, and faculty in the community here into the basics of RNA-seq and provide an overview of the technique and methods. So let's get started. Uh, this slide I'm just showing that RNA-seq has largely replaced microarray as the predominant method for measuring gene expression. You can see that in about 2012 uh, RNA-seq overtook microarray in terms of the number of grants funded to uh, study gene expression. And there are a number of reasons for this. Um, some of the major reasons are that RNA-seq offers some significant advantages in terms of providing a more comprehensive overview of the transcriptome. Uh, it allows for better dynamic range against uh, microarray. And then, of course, it also allows for discovery of novel isoforms, novel gene fusions, and things like uh, single nucleotide variants that you cannot find with uh, microarrays. Microarrays are more limited because you have to have a probe set on the chip ahead of time that's based on your prior knowledge. It used to be that microarrays were higher throughput and lower cost, and that the analysis was more user-friendly, but that's, that's all changing, and really RNA-seq now is actually lower cost. So here at the University of Iowa, uh, you can get a single RNA-seq sample for about $300. This is using the Illumina HiSeq 4000 short read technology. This, this will give you about 20 to 30 million reads, uh, paired end reads per sample, and uh, on our HiSeq 4000 you can get up to 12 samples per lane. So RNA-seq is a complex uh, topic with many different aspects, and uh, there's not time to go into deep uh, depth and detail on each one of these aspects in this short screencast. Um, this was about a 50 minute talk and I'm going to try to, for the sake of this YouTube video, shorten it down uh, hopefully to about 30 minutes. So I just want to briefly touch on a few areas and I've organized them in a way that I find logical, starting with uh, experimental design, moving on to sequencing design, quality control, alignment, differential expression testing, and then functional profiling. So I'll only be talking about uh, mRNA-seq largely. Uh, today. There are, it's important to be aware that there are other types of RNA-seq, small RNA-seq, total RNA-seq, um, single cell, etc. So if we're considering the Illumina technology, um, on the right I'm showing a diagram of how the RNA-seq experiment generally uh, takes place. It typically starts by selecting a population of cells or tissue and extracting your RNA. Then there's a step that selects out the messenger RNA and fragments it. These are then converted to cDNAs, and adapters are added to those cDNAs to create a library for sequencing. The sequencing is carried out on a Illumina sequencer, like this one shown here, and uh, then the reads are mapped onto the genome and quantified. One choice you'll have to make when you're thinking about designing a RNA-seq experiment is the choice of single-end versus paired-end sequencing. Um, single end is, is still a little bit cheaper, so for example here on campus, uh, single end sequencing is about $1,372 and paired end is $1,700, so it's a little, a little more expensive. If you just care about sort of a uh, general uh, look at uh, gene expression and, and you're not as concerned about detecting low expression genes or, or uh, mapping uh, for novel novel isoform discovery or something, you might be able to get away with single-end sequencing and save some money. Paired-end sequencing does offer the advantages of improving accuracy, especially for low-expressed genes, um, improves mapping across exon-exon junctions, etc. It's important, too, to plan for adequate read depth in your experiments. Um, this graphic just illustrates why, in a visual way, why that's important. Uh, generally, in your sample RNA, most of RNA is going to be taken up, most of the RNA in the pool is going to be highly expressed genes. And these may not be biologically the ones that you care about. The ones you care about are probably in this pool of all the other genes. If you don't have enough read depth, most of your reads will be um, 
taken up by the highly expressed genes, leaving too few to adequately cover the rest. So you do have to have enough. That said, uh, there is a trade-off here between more read depth and more biological replicates. And so if you're if you're thinking about trading off between these two things, it's important to consider that you do get more bang for your buck, especially with high and medium expressed genes with adding more replicates versus adding more reads. So if we look at the plot on the upper left here, you can see that uh, this is the number of reads in millions and the number of detected differentially expressed genes at a given false discovery rate. And what you can see is that uh, by about 10 million reads, adding more read depth does not improve detection very much until you get out to about 30 million, but even then it's a very small improvement. But as, as you add replicates, each of these lines goes is another replicate, so 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 to 6 to 7. You can see by the time you've gone from uh, 2 to 4 replicates, you've added another uh, 200 um, differentially expressed genes to your list, and by the time you've gone to six, you've actually doubled the number of genes that you've detected. And the same generally holds true for medium expressed genes here as well. If, if that's what you care about, um, and you're not super focused on detecting extremely low expressed genes, it's better to err on the side of more replicates rather than uh, deeper sequencing. Now, the situation is a little different for low expressed genes. Here, sequencing and replicates matter, so you can see that as you increase read depth, you do get a linear, sort of a linear increase in uh, the number of uh, DE genes that you can detect. But even here, you still get kind of more bang for your buck by just adding replicates. Uh, this is an app that you can use when you're planning your experiments. It's only on Android as, as of right now. Uh, but what it lets you do is put in a uh, genome that you're uh, planning to work with or transcriptome and then specify a fold change that you want to be able to detect, a minimum fold change, and the number of replicates you're planning to work with. And then it, it outputs a, uh, a table that has something about um, the different technologies that you might want to use, um, the, the kits, the number of samples you can expect to get per flow cell, the number of samples you can expect to get per lane, um, the read depth, and things like that. Um, then there's also competing technologies that focus more on long reads, uh, leaving now the realm of Illumina. Um, we're looking here at the nanopore technology, which promises to deliver and does deliver uh, very long reads. And it does this by embedding a uh, protein nanopore in an, a polymer membrane and then processing DNA through that uh, through that nanopore. And this allows for very long reads to be produced, um, many thousands of bases long. Um, so this technology can be found on uh, devices like the MinION, which uses the flow cell technology and the, the nanopore technology. And uh, this can be had for about $1,000 to get started uh, doing long read research. And the value of long reads are that you can um, very accurately detect the uh, presence of transcripts uh, transcript isoforms in a sample, uh, especially if you're looking for rare or novel isoforms. Um, this is an example where uh, you've got your nanopore long reads here um, aligned, and uh, out of that they were able to build a consensus of the uh, transcripts that are present. Okay, so we've talked about experimental design, now let's talk a little bit about sequencing design. And uh, so I'll just briefly touch on a few things. Um, for RNA-seq, a commonly used kit for library preparation is the Illumina TrueSeq protocol. Uh, it proceeds through a few steps here where you've got your polydenylated mRNA, which is selected out with a oligo DT bead. Then that's washed and fragmented and primed, then reverse transcribed to cDNA. Then uh, there's some end repair and phosphorylation that's done to prepare the cDNAs for the addition of sequencing adapters. And these sequencing adapters generally contain a uh, part that allows them to uh, bind the flow cell for uh, clustering needed to do sequencing by synthesis. And uh, then there are sequencing internal sequencing primers that, that provide the forward and reverse uh, start points for the, the forward and reverse reads. And then there's generally a uh, barcode area for 
multiplexing of samples. When you do the TrueSeq mRNA, uh, you can expect to get about 70% of your uh, reads from exonic regions. Um, if you do total RNA-seq, uh, then it's just important to be aware that less of your reads are going to be coming from exonic regions, and so uh, you may need to sequence to a deeper depth to achieve the same uh, sensitivity. Another thing that comes up sometimes in experiments is uh, this problem of having library preps that uh, span across days or use more than one reagent kit or something like that. And the, the important thing to remember here is just do everything you can to avoid confounding your technical and experimental um, variables. So don't do all of your control samples on Monday and all of your uh, knockouts on Tuesday or something. Um, randomize them across days. And the same thing goes for reagent batches, kits, and things like that. Once the sequencing has been done and you have your reads back, the next step is to do some quality control of those reads. There are a number of metrics that we look at. I'm not showing all of them. I don't have time to talk about all of them, but uh, some of the main things that we look at, of course, are the FRED quality scores. Uh, these are uh, numeric scores that are given at each position, each base within the read, um, and uh, they indicate the probability that the call was correct at that position. And what what is shown here is the mean uh, across each sample at each position within the read. So this is position 0, and this is position 150, and so at each position represents the mean for all reads in that sample. And so what we're looking for is just everything to stay high across uh, across the reads. This is very in, uh, indicative of the kind of quality of the data that comes off of Illumina machines, especially here in our genomics facility, genomics division. Um, we almost never see real problems with quality. Another uh, indicator you can look at is adapter content. So this is now percent of sequences containing adapter uh, as detected by the program. And again, this is position along the reads for each sample. And you can see that in this experiment, at least, uh, there is some adapter contamination towards the end of the reads. And that can happen when the um, sequencing fragment, the cDNA fragment, is too short and uh, the sequencing chemistry continues uh, to sequence all the way through the end of the fragment and into the opposite adapter. Another metric to be aware of is GC content. Um, this can be used to diagnose problems with the library prep. Uh, typically, if we're doing like an RNA-seq, you want to see uh, GC content that has kind of a smooth uh, progression here without a lot of peaks. Um, the peaks can represent contamination, um, but it's important to remember that it's not always a problem. Um, for example, if you're doing a total RNA-seq and you have a lot of R ribosomal RNA around, that can give you a separate, uh, separate peak as well. Another QC that we do is to look at uh, the proportion of reads coming from different references. So, for example, if you have a mouse experiment, you want to see that most of your reads are coming from mouse and not from something else. So, um, this, uh, this is a program called FastQ Screen that will take a random subsample of the reads from each, uh, from each sample and uh, map them to a variety of common contaminant genomes and uh, other genomes that you specify and then give you a, a visual report. So this is an example of a good experiment where the vast majority of your mouse reads came from mouse, some came from rat owing to homology between mouse and rat. I also like to look at the percent of reads that map to the reference. Um, generally this hovers around 80 to 85 to 90 percent. Uh, and then there's 20% that don't map for a variety of reasons. Also, we look at genomic origin of the reads. So we want to see most of the reads coming from exonic uh, genomic origins because we're trying to capture transcripts here, messenger RNAs. And so typically about 80% of those are exonic and the rest are intronic or intergenic. So this looks good. Uh, I also look at PCR duplicates. Um, some proportion of the library is always duplicated in these experiments. It ranges from about 15 to 30 percent. Um, on the left here I'm showing a plot where you have 
I'm just plotting the number of read map, reads mapped per sample, each dot is a sample, and the percent duplicated, and you can see it hovers around 15%. Duplication typically indicates a problem with uh, PCR amplification of the library. Just recently a paper came out that aims to help with this duplication problem by allowing uh, the identification of true PCR duplicates from um, actual duplicates, and so it, uh, it, it relies on incorporating molecular identifiers into the TrueSeq adapters, and so previously duplicate identification was done by coordinate only, so if you had three reads at this position, the assumption is that two of them are PCR duplicates, and so they'd be removed, and with the uh, molecular identifiers in the TrueSeq adapters, now you can know that um, you have the two red stars that identify identify real uh, PCR duplicates, and so you only remove one of these, leaving two reads at this position, which effectively doubles your estimate of expression at that position. So it promises to be more accurate, and um, it's probably a technique that we'll see incorporated more and more into sequencing library preparation. Okay, so if you've quality controlled your library, now you want to uh, align and quantify those reads to a reference genome. So the read alignment problem is, uh, is complex and uh, we benefit from um, many decades of, of computer science research and very smart computer scientists and biologists thinking about this problem and, and producing techniques to solve it. Um, if you're interested in, in learning more about uh, read alignment, I encourage you to uh, take Ben Langmead's excellent course called Algorithms for Genomic Data Science. It's available on Coursera.com. Um, I believe it's free. But uh, anyway, so the realignment problem is uh, kind of a, analogous to you know solving a puzzle where you have your short reads, or puzzle pieces, and then you have a reference, which is your uh, puzzle picture, and you're trying to m map all those out to end up with a solved puzzle. In terms of uh, reads, uh, what this actually you know looks like is billions of short reads that have to be aligned one at a time to a uh, reference string of bases that's millions of lines long. So there are two main approaches to do this. There's um, uh, true alignment or splice aware alignment and then there's pseudo alignment which I'll talk about shortly. Um, so we'll first talk about reference based uh, alignment. Uh, and this is where the reads are mapped directly to the reference genome um, while allowing critically for splice junctions across exons. So uh, in the figure on the right you can see why this is important because your uh, pre-mRNA contains exons and introns but then the mRNA is just the spliced out exons put together. So you're going to get some short reads that cross these exon-exon junctions which do not map directly back to the reference. And so you need an aligner that's aware of that and can deal with that split. These uh, methods typically uh, run on clusters because they do require a large amount of memory or CPU time or both. Um, it's important to realize that if you need to do discovery of novel isoforms and things, you must do these kind of full alignments. And uh, some tools you could consider using that are kind of state-of-the-art include STAR, HiSat2, and TopHat2. The other approach uh, that represents a really important step forward uh, in uh, RNA-seq is pseudo-alignment. And it's, it's a step forward because it uh, contains a key insight, which is that typically you don't really care about aligning each read exactly within a transcript. You, you just want to know, for the purposes of counting, you know, where the read came from. Um, because really what we're trying to do is just quantify transcript expression. So it doesn't really matter. If you don't care about discovery, it doesn't really matter where the read mapped to, just who it mapped to. And that's the key insight in pseudo-alignment. And, and that insight, um, when elaborated in algorithmic form, leads to a enormous speed up in uh, uh, computational uh, speed and uh, time savings and also is much, much more lightweight in terms of memory footprint as well, to the point where you can run pseudo-alignment on your laptop in a few minutes and uh, align what used to take hours or days on clusters. 
and it's just as accurate in many cases, or more accurate in some cases. So this is a really important innovation, and it's important to be aware of this. Um, in order to do pseudo alignment, you need a reference transcriptome. So you uh, you need uh, a uh, curated collection of uh, uh, transcripts that uh, are believed to belong to the organism that you're studying, and uh, but there's no need here to be splice aware. So so we're mapping to a transcriptome, not the reference genome. Um, and then, as I mentioned, reads are judged on compatibility with the transcripts. They're not exactly aligned. Okay, so now you've either used traditional reference-based alignment or pseudo-alignment to uh, align and quantify your reads. And uh, the next step that the vast majority of investigators that I've worked with are interested in is differential expression testing. Um, one of the first things I do before I run a differential expression tester is uh, dimensionality reduction. And I do this because I want to know how the samples relate to each other. Um, so this aims to reduce the complexity of the expression data down to a, a two-axis graph that you can visually understand. Um, so I use principal component analysis, and um, I usually plot the first and second, or maybe first and third principal components. And then I color the points by their treatment status. So control and experiment, or in this case, control in day two and day 21. And I'm, I'm looking for points that hopefully cluster with each other, meaning that the uh, replicates within each condition are more similar to each other than they are to other uh, treatment groups. And you can see this is generally the case where control clusters here, and day two clusters here, and day 21 clusters here, with uh, kind of a weird day 21 outlier. And so PCA is an important method for considering outliers, and uh, you generally have to at least make a cursory investigation of these kinds of things to see whether this uh, sample should be kept in the experiment or whether it should be dropped because it risks skewing the results. And uh, this is another important argument for more replicates because if you have more, then dropping an outlier is not as damaging. So differential expression testing comes down to this question, which is, is there a statistically significant difference in the counts or in the expression, um, could be transcripts per million, uh, between two conditions within, within one gene or transcript. So this is a plot for one transcript here, and uh, I'm showing under three conditions, eight replicates in each condition. So these are the eight replicates in control, where there's no expression, the replicates in day two, where there's a little bit, and then uh, day 21, where there seems to be more. But the question is, is this really more, or are these just um, by chance? Uh, so I don't have time to get into the details of how to answer this question, but I'll just talk about some of the methods that are available to address this. Um, and so it's important to note that uh, there are dozens of uh, differential expression testers, and what I want to emphasize in this slide is just that there's no one gold standard uh, pipeline or best way to measure differential expression or, or test its statistical significance. Uh, it really depends on your goals in your research study and what you're trying to accomplish. Um, as this uh, really nice uh, work from Claire Williams uh, that came out this year shows where uh, she tested hundreds of different pipelines, she showed that precision and recall are a trade-off and a choice you make when you choose different pipelines. She also showed that your choice of differential expression tester is the most important in terms of the kind of results that you get, and your choice of read alignment and expression modeler or quantifier is less important. So really it's this choice of your final tool for the statistical expression testing that makes the biggest difference in your results. So you can see in this plot here where each point represents a combination of three uh, three tools, one from each category, read aligner, expression modeler, and differential expression tester. And uh, so these are hundreds of pipelines and you can see that generally they form a trade-off between high precision and high recall. And so if you're doing an experiment where you're planning to do 
uh, go in and qPCR test everything that you find in that experiment, you might want to look for a more high precision pipeline. If you're uh, more interested in predicting uh, enriched pathways where you just want to get as many genes as possible detected, then you might want to look for a higher recall pipeline. And so there's, there's really no one best way, and uh, it's important to identify what your analysis goals are before setting out. Another issue that comes up in uh, RNA-seq differential expression testing is the sense that we're really doing hundreds of different experiments because at each gene we're testing for differential expression and that's really one experiment or one hypothesis. So testing across thousands of genes requires uh, correction for multiple comparisons. Now there are two common ways in statistics to do this, the Bonferroni correction and the false discovery rate. Um, and I'll just say that uh, the false discovery rate has been adopted as the primary approach in RNA-seq because it operates on the whole population and aims to keep the false positive rate below a threshold that you find acceptable. So when you have all of this uh, completed, what you get out of it is a table that contains the genes or the, or the transcripts that are differentially expressed, um, the FDR corrected p-values, which we call q-values, the uh, an estimate of the log fold change and uh, the uh, gene names. So after you have done differential expression testing in your, your list of differentially expressed genes, typically investigators want to then put that into a biological context that makes sense. And one way to do that is uh, this idea of functional profiling. Functional profiling is this process of taking these lists of, of genes that are changing under different conditions and uh, identifying pathways or uh, transcriptional networks or regulators that are uh, enriched beyond what you'd expect uh, by chance. So uh, one uh, major commercial software package to do this is called Ingenuity. And uh, we maintain two licenses for that here at the University of Iowa. So uh, if you're a researcher here, you can have access to Ingenuity, and I encourage you uh, to do so. The way that you get access to it is by going to this link here at the bottom of the page. And, uh, whoops, sorry. And if you go to that link, you'll see uh, this uh, information here where you can learn how to register for an account. So, IPA has a number of different analyses. One of the um, most popular, I guess, is the canonical pathway enrichment. <clears throat> this is where you put in gene IDs, uh, fold changes, and Q values. And what you get out are pathways that are enriched. And uh, there's an associated Q value with that, and also a Z-score. And so the Z-score tells you whether the pathway is expected to change uh, up or down, up, up regulated or down regulated. And uh, the ratio tells you how many, uh, what the ratio of genes in your results list are to the number uh, in the pathway itself. So this is an example result where it's showing that the cholesterol biosynthesis and IL-8 signaling and ROA signaling and P10 signaling are some of the most uh, overrepresented or enriched in the gene expression results and um, are present way beyond what you'd expect by chance. Another common analysis from IPA is the downstream effects analysis. This is uh, similar to the canonical enriched pathways, uh, except it, it displays the data in a different way, where now it's organizing by disease type, so injury here, cancer, cell death and survival, cell movement, and then each block is colored by the z-score for that particular sub unit and you can click on these and, and drill down in these to get more information. IPA also produces these nice publication ready plots of transcription networks um, that are colored by whether regulators are uh, increased or decreased. Now if you're here at the University of Iowa um, and you have more questions about uh, this talk, I encourage you to um, go
go uh, see Kevin Knudsen in the Genomics Corps for help with library prep, sequencing design, um, and grant writing. Uh, they can uh, help you with a lot of things beyond just RNA-seq. They can also do DNA-seq, chip-seq, um, single cell, uh, whole exome, and whole genome. So go talk to them, um, and they'll be happy to help you with that side of things. And on the bioinformatics side, I encourage you to uh, come talk to us here in the Iowa Institute of Human Genetics Bioinformatics Division. Um, Diana is our uh, director, and you can also talk to me. I'm happy to sit down and take a meeting with you and talk about your RNA-seq experiments. Um, you know, we're here to help researchers in the in the community here with their uh, research, and uh, we can do everything from experimental design to downstream analysis on a fee-for-service basis. We can also help with manuscript prep and uh, write grant applications. So on the left here, I'm just showing some uh, recent publications that we've had a hand in producing data for, producing figures, and also co-authoring. Um, and that brings me to the end of my talk, so thank you for your attention, and I hope this was a helpful screencast.